Dr. Carrier, I read your book, Why I'm Not a Christian, on page... Go ahead. Oh. Yeah. Uh, on page 74, you say this about... Uh, well, you say this. The only things we have ever proven to exist are matter, energy, space, and time, and countless different origins, arrangements and behaviors of these. Therefore, the natural inference is that these are the only things there are. So matter, energy, space, and time are the only things that exist. That's it. But surely you don't believe that the laws of logic to be composed of any of these, as they are abstract in nature. So when you appeal to proving such things using the laws of logic, you are appealing to something that, according to you, doesn't exist in the universe. Thus, your worldview is an example of a worldview which, as it were, cuts off the tree branch that it's sitting on or it's self-refuting. How then to propose to prove anything at all, whether in science, philosophy, anything, including the claim that your own worldview is true? Yeah, for those who are interested in that subject, um, that's a form of the argument from reason. I have an entire article on it online um, on my website, richardcarrier.info, under naturalism as a worldview. Uh, my article, um, critiquing Victor Reppert's uh, book on this subject, will have all the detail you need. Um, just very briefly on that, logic is actually just a language. It's just a way of talking about the things you're looking at. So when you say laws of logic, all you're talking about is the actual facts of the way matter and energy and space and time behave. You're actually describing space time, you're describing matter and energy. Uh, all physical laws are abstractions, right? They're actually uh, statements that are true for multiple different particular objects. So when you talk about the laws of, laws of logic, the most fundamental law of logic is the law of non-contradiction, right? Uh, that basically is just saying that there are distinctions. Uh, if you look at any physical universe that's only composed of matter, energy, space, and time, there will be physical distinctions in there, and you can describe them, and that's what the law of non-contradiction is. It's just a description of the fact that there are differences between different arrangements of space and time, different arrangements of matter and energy. Uh, so as long as you can have different arrangements of space and time and matter and energy, logic describes that universe. So there isn't really anything additionally unique. All you need is matter, energy, space, and time. All the laws of logic then entail, and they follow from that. They're just a description of that. Uh, you said that public school ought to be representative of the people, that it ought to be democratic. Um, then I was wondering how you would answer the charge that Christians are being denied representation, since you did state quite clearly at the beginning of your talk, and I agree with this, that there are religious implications and consequences down the line for um, teaching and believing ev evolutionism. So if evolution is the only viewpoint allowed in schools, then naturally Christians are being denied representation. And I'm sure you're, you would respond that you can't teach all viewpoints, particularly those that many believe to be incorrect. And I agree, but since there's always gonna be disagreement, particularly in a large proportion of the United States, we saw the uh, diagrams showing how many people disagree with evolution, should the government be responsible for a unilateral education at all since it inherently is impossible to be democratic? So there was a slide in your question between uh, what I said, that education is under democratic control and your attribution of me the position that education should be representative. Now there's a distinction. If the reason you can't teach creationism in the public schools is because under the constitution of this country, the government cannot be in the business of saying what religious views are correct or what religious views are incorrect. Teaching creationism is scientifically credible would be teaching that a particular religious view on evolution is correct, and that's the reason it's forbidden. Uh, if people are unhappy with that, they still have democratic options. For example, calling for a constitutional convention to revoke the First Amendment or replace it with something else. So in this sense, uh, it is, we're still under democratic control, but I'm not suggesting that for example, if 90% of a community is Catholic, that we should teach Catholic doctrines in the public schools in that community, which I take it would be what it would be for uh, education to be representative. Now, of course, even in countries, as I said, where we, there isn't a separation between church and state, they don't teach creationism as scientifically credible, and that's because it's terrible science. I should also add, of course, that many Christians, many Christian denominations, and many individual Christians don't have theological problems with evolution. I was not asserting that the theological challenges that I mentioned were insurmountable. I don't take a view on that. 
All I have to say is that some Christians have found them surmountable, some have found them insurmountable. This is a religious dispute, not a scientific dispute. Could you name three serious questions that evolution has not answered? Um, is there an 11th planet in the solar system, or 10th, or whatever we're on right now? have a question for you. You, you kind of just uh, jumped over Aristotle with regard, you know, to his teleological explanation for ontology. It seems to me that's the real present. I noticed on, in the first page of Origin of Species, Darwin also mentioned uh, Aristotle's views, which, where he was arguing against the idea of natural selection. I just wondered why you kind of left Aristotle out on this. Yeah, um, well, I was dealing with Roman period science, so Aristotle's hundreds of years before that. Oh, I see. Um, but really, Aristotle, uh, and I included him on that list of the, the backstory. Did you go to the, Epicurus? And yeah, yeah, he, he was one of the, Epicurus was kind of arguing against Aristotle. Aristotle was slightly arguing against Plato. Plato was arguing against, you know, his predecessors and so on. Um, Medieval Christians thought Aristotle was the shit, right? They thought he was the, the, the pinnacle of ancient science and philosophy. Um, so medieval Christians, once they, eventually, once they rediscovered Aristotle, by the way, they forgot about him for hundreds and hundreds of years, and then eventually they rediscovered him and thought he was awesome and thought that he represented everything that the ancients had achieved scientifically. Um, in reality, Aristotle started organized ancient science, uh, and then right. within a few hundred years, almost everything he said was refuted by someone else. Uh, and so you have people like Th that's where I, I kind of disagree about Th Thales being the first. Oh, because sure. Yeah. Aristotle invented. The yeah, Aristotle was the first to systematize the study of it, right? Uh, what Thales did, and I didn't get time to go through the list of things. What Thales started was the, the first attempt to actually explain nature in terms of natural causes without supernatural so, beings, but um, without the scientific method. Well, yeah, exactly. He's, he, and that's the thing I had on listed in there is he's the first to start an inquiry into method. He didn't solve the methodological problems. Um, even Aristotle didn't really solve them either, but he actually started the systematic study of it. Like, let's make this serious, let's organize it into subject headings and, and all of that. And he started like the first uh, an actual anatomical experience, the, the first uh, vivisection experiments. Um, Aristotle actually studied fetal development by cracking open eggs at different stages of development and things like this. Uh, but he actually started all of this, and then subsequent scientists started improving on his work and correcting some of it and so on. Uh, and that was even before the Roman Empire. And then when the Romans, they inherited all of these achievements of the Greeks. Um, which were not just Aristotle's, but all this other stuff. And then we get Galen and Ptolemy and so on, working on, building on him, yeah. I was just wondering, you guys both discussed your uh, colleagues in the creationist standpoint, like Behe and all of them, and you had clear viewpoints on how you felt about them. I was wondering if you had met any of them and, and how they actually discussed it with you, because I just can't really see any way that they could argue their point to a scientist, you know, so I just wondered if it was like how that came across, if you'd ever met any of them and what they actually said rather than what they've published and that right. kind of thing. Yeah, really all we can work with is what they've published for the public because certainly I, even if I had met him personally and started saying, well, Behe said all this stuff, if he hadn't published it, he could just deny it, right? So, so that, that's difficult too. Um, no, I work with what's published so that the public can also share in the conversation so they can see what's going on. Um, I haven't met Behe. I have met various creationists uh, over time, but, uh, but Behe I have not met. Um, and I don't have any particular opinion about him as a man. Uh, I'm just looking at what kinds of claims he's made. Even in his most recent book, where he kind of agrees that some of evolution theory is true, um, he's very vague as to which parts are true and which parts are false. Uh, and he has, still has not to this day done any scientific research to back any of his claims. And, um, so that, that's my take on that, and I'm just discussing, like, that's the status of things as they are now. Did you have something else to add? Well, I haven't met Galen. <laughs> uh, I've, I've met uh, Behe, I've met a number of creationists. Uh, like Richard, I kind of tend to go by uh, what they have done in print, in part because, you know, that's, that's the authoritative, authoritative version, that's kind of the version that they have been putting out for people to evaluate. I've been to in lectures by some of these people, uh, Behe, Hovind, um, Hugh Ross. I think it would be kind of unfair to play gotcha with things that they were doing on the stage, things that they do on print, presumably they've looked over and thought about. Thank you. It's funny you mentioned the flood um, explanation of the Grand Canyon because this landscape was actually shaped by a massive flood. And the guy who proposed it, Bretz, in 1920s, I think it was, 
to say that he was criticized is to put it nicely. And a lot of this criticism came because they thought it was a pro-creationism idea, like this cataclysmic flood, that they were a little defensive about it, scientists. So my question is, how do scientists defend what they know without being defensive? Well, I mean, there are a number of cases where scientists have had a hard time getting their views across. Brett's is one example. Uh, Barry Hall, who established that um, Heliobacter rather pylori rather than stress was causing ulcers, is another one, and he ended up getting a Nobel Prize over it, so good for him. Um, yeah. uh, plate tectonics, thank you, is another example. Alfred Wegener, who suggested continental drift didn't really have a good mechanism, and people thought he was, you know, making it all up and kind of crazy. And uh, it wasn't until plate tectonics was formulated during the 60s that people say, hey, that Wagner guy, maybe he was onto something. Unfortunately, it died back in the 20s, I believe. Um, so there probably isn't a good solution because for every misunderstood genius who got it right, there are going to be tens or hundreds of misunderstood less than geniuses who got it wrong. And they keep on emailing me, too. Um, <laughs> Uh, but, you know, this is a kind of very broad question about the social dynamics of science. There are probably aren't any easy answers about how to make things better without simultaneously making them worse. And it's kind of the thing that uh, scientific leaders and organizers and societies struggle with trying to figure out. I would just add, I would just add that if they, as long as they stick to the facts and the logic, um, the heated arguments and so on, as long as they keep being empirical, uh, the reality is that the truth will shake out eventually, even if it takes too long. But uh, uh, so that's actually the process of science that works very well, is the, the willingness to criticize and actually rebut back. And as long as everybody's going to be honest in that uh, debate, then, then things will move forward eventually. Dr. Carrier, um, I was curious why, uh, when you were giving an example of a Christian uh, in antiquity that um, was obviously closed-minded, only believe in God, don't uh, inquire into the physical world. Um, I was wondering why you didn't mention uh, many, 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 many scientists who were um, devout Christians, and uh, maybe it was because they weren't ancient, uh, but more all, all the way from uh, first century to now. Uh, history of science is, is peppered with, with Christians who, who were motivated by uh, their, their love of creation and inquired into the natural world. And I'm just wondering why you left those out. Yeah. Um, well, that actually wasn't what, what my talk was about. I right. was comparing the Ken Hams from antiquity with the actual ancient scientists, or the okay. scientists of the different societies. In an ancient world, it was the scientists were predominantly creationists, actually, that were arguing against the Ken Hams back right. then. Right. Um, and actually part of the point, and of course I had to cover a lot of other points, so right. I couldn't bring this particular aspect out, and I have done in past versions of, of this material, is to point out that what I'm saying about Galen actually describes a lot of Christians today, right? Is that, mm -hmm. that Galen saw a compatibility between science and, and theology. He saw a way to make them work together without even having to compartmentalize them uh, the way that a lot of people do. Let's, let's not even apply science to our theology. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's a model that I think Christians can get behind. That they can say, you know, it's been done before and was very successful. Maybe we can borrow that idea for ourselves. And I think there are Christians who are already doing that. So that is definitely true. Mm -hmm. um, it's just not generally true of the Christians who are trying to tear down science because it's going against their theology. Um, and that, that's really the, the problem where they're putting theology before empiricism. Uh, and even using that to sort of shut down the, even the idea of scientific progress by telling you to not even ask questions, for instance. That's the most extreme variety, which we get at Ken Ham's right. museum. Uh, but that's not all Christianity. You're absolutely right. Uh, and there, there's, in all religions, you can have both views of approaching it. One is bad, and one is not so bad. So yeah. So Dr. Richard Carrier, uh, in celebration of science and reason, uh, how can we address the nihilistic undertones of modern day science? And how can we find, in an objective universe, reason? Oh, humanism. I think we have a lot of humanists in this room here, right? Yes. Um, I, I mean, I, here I am. Uh, people make fun of me rightly for plugging my books all the time. 
Um, and I'm going to do that again. Uh, actually, uh, I actually brought a few copies at the next venue we're going to go to for the after party after this. I'm going to sell some of them. I don't have a lot, so they might sell out quickly. I don't know. Uh, four copies of my um, first book, 2005, which is called Sense and Goodness Without God, A Defense of Metaphysical Naturalism, uh, which was written, I wrote that specifically to answer that question. Uh, is it's, it's not enough to say what we don't believe in. We've got to talk about what we, sh what we do believe in, what we should believe in. And so most of that book is about what atheists should believe and how they should move forward in terms of values, in terms of their understanding of reality and so on. Because uh, not a lot of books have been written about, still to this day, not a lot of books have been written about what atheists should believe versus what they don't and why they don't believe them. Um, so that book is very much on that track, is the idea of these are the values and these are why these values are important to adopt. Uh, and even like have a chapter on the meaning of life and other things like that. Um, so, and I very myself have argued against nihilists. Uh, there are modern nihilists uh, still. Um, I have some ar articles on my old blog that, that deal with this as well. Uh, so, so yeah, I'm very much as much arguing against them as I am against um, Christians and whatnot that, that take a different view. But yeah. Thank you very much.